In a previous video, we looked at a kernel exploit in Serenity OS, which was the intended solution for the Wisdom 2 challenge from the HXP CTF. But of course, Serenity OS is a big software project, so there might have been more security issues. And in this video, I want to look at another solution for this challenge. So basically, another kernel exploit. Actually, our team Alice was the only team that solved this challenge during the CTF. But as always, I have to mention, this was not me. This team is insane and I did not contribute to the success. It just blows my mind how skilled the Alice members are, especially when you know how young they are. In this case, it was incredible Linus Hensi again, solving it alone. Feels bad, man. It's crazy to think back at how much I knew over five years ago when I started with my binary exploitation course. At the time, I felt I already had some nice experience. But you should always keep in mind that over all those years since then, I kept learning more stuff and accumulated more knowledge and skills. And I think that's important for you to remember. You can also learn all that stuff. It just takes time, literally years. And so in this video, I want to share with you one new thing I learned. I just learned something new from Linus's Serenity OS exploit. And it makes me really excited because it's a thing that I never really understood and it finally clicked for me. Like with the previous exploit, Andreas Kling, the developer of Serenity OS, made a whole video going over the write-up of the exploit, explaining the vulnerability, looking at the kernel source code and fixing the issue. Because that video is already very technical and detailed, I thought I will try to have a bit of a different angle with my video. I want to focus on my Eureka moment instead. So let's head in. Sometimes when I think about how computers work, I get this feeling of it's kind of simple. I can see how complex code is compiled to very simple instructions, which then get executed by a CPU. Also, maybe you know that I've spent many, many hours working on Ben Eater's 8-bit computer. And when you develop each part of a CPU by hand, you really start to feel like you understand it. I have also played a lot with very simple electronics like an Arduino, which have an Atmega AVR microprocessor. Or maybe you even remember my series about the research into the hardware wallet, which included a lot of details about ARM microprocessors. But the thing is, on one side, I understand how higher level C code programs can be compiled to machine code and how they run. I understand how an ELF binary is loaded into memory and then executed. I know my way around reverse engineering them. I know how to debug them and so forth. And on the other side, I understand very low level code running on a microprocessor. For example, this basic Arduino code where I can simply set a pin to high or low and that makes an LED blink. I understand that. I understand that there are transistors that decode some instructions that will then lead to the toggle of a wire that goes to the outside, to this pin, thus turning this on or off. But there's something in the middle of those two worlds that I have very little experience with. And as soon as I think about this middle part, I suddenly get this feeling that I actually do not understand a single thing about computers. And this thing in the middle is basically the world where the kernel lies. It's what makes modern CPUs like an Intel CPU so much more complex than a microprocessor. What I'm basically referring to are the privilege levels, ring 0, 1, 2, 3. You probably have heard those terms before. But of course, I have some knowledge about operating system kernels. So what do I already know? I've actually made a few videos where I explain some stuff about the Linux kernel. For example, in the binary exploitation playlist, I introduced syscalls. I have made videos about Docker containers and the Linux kernel namespace feature that enables that. In those videos, we also looked at kernel source code to better understand how that works. I also made a video about the Linux device drivers book, which was a huge aha moment for me when I understood some stuff about it. And in the last Serenity OS video, you can also see how I feel comfortable reading the syscall source code of the Serenity kernel. But all those topics that I have prior experience with have one thing in common. They are very close to the user land. It is kernel code, it is high privilege code, and there are some quirks to that but it still feels and looks like relatively simple code. There's nothing really hardware specific in those areas. And that's the crux of the matter. 
I'm missing the link between the software world and the hardware world. How exactly does Linux talk to a hard drive? How exactly do key presses on a physical thing end up as input to a program? When you look at very simple microcontrollers like looking at an Arduino or Ben Eder's 8-bit computer that I was building, I can understand how this microprocessor can talk to hardware. I can understand that there is a wire going out of this chip driven by transistor logic and then it can talk to an LED to turn it on or off. But I don't understand how a modern Intel CPU is connected to the physical world. How do drivers talk to a physical hard drive? And this is where we come back to Linus's Serenity OS exploit. It's a really creative exploit. In some ways a super simple exploit, but it offered me an opportunity to learn about this missing link. So let's quickly hear how Andreas summarizes the kernel vulnerability abused in this exploit. Basically they discovered uh, another flaw in our ptrace implementation. Quick reminder, ptrace is a syscall, so a kernel feature that allows one process to debug another process, read, write the other process's memory, single step execution, change registers, so the kind of stuff GDB implements. And the issue is that we just um, accept the um, E flags coming from one process to the other. That makes it possible to overwrite um, certain CPU flags that you really shouldn't let user programs change, like the I.O. privilege uh, register, for example. And that's um, how they exploit this. So they change the IOPL, the um, I.O. privilege level, um, and elevate the I.O. privilege of their own process, um, making it possible for it to talk to hardware. And then once they have hardware access, they can talk to the hard disk and extract information that way. And that's actually what their exploit does. So the exploit contains a small um, IDE hard disk driver, very small, just um, like reads one sector. And you know the typical objective of a CTF, read a flag from a file. And the Wisdom 2 challenge actually had a second hard drive connected that contained this flag. So if your program can directly talk to hardware, they can just directly ask the hard drive to give them the data stored on it. And you completely bypass any of the permission checks that the operating system might have implemented in the kernel. Theoretically, you could also directly talk to the main drive, overwrite any set UID binary, and then you can just easily get root. But here it was enough to just read some data from the hard drive. What they do is they attach with ptrace to a child, then they get the registers of the remote process, and then they write back the registers after modifying the flags, setting the IOPL to 3, which means that ring 3 is allowed to have uh, IO access, I suppose. So what are the E-flags? Let's fire up GDB, run a basic program like bin ls, let the program single step and run for a bit, and then let's look at the info registers output. Here are all the registers of the process we are debugging. Under the hood, GDB used ptrace to ask the kernel, please give me the registers of this process. And then GDB displayed it here. So here's the stack pointer, here's the instruction pointer that points to the next code being executed. You have other general purpose registers. So these are just small memory cells in the CPU that your code can use to calculate stuff. And if you followed my binary exploitation playlist, you are pretty familiar with those. But what's up with the registers down here? They are a bit weird registers. And for your regular program, you usually don't deal with them. They sometimes differ between operating systems, how they're used. And they are actually another thing I don't understand myself yet. But I want to focus for now on the e -flex. And the E flags are a bit like internal CPU housekeeping flags. Some of them you might be familiar with. For example, ZF. It's the zero flag set by most instructions if the result of the operation is binary zero. That's basically how if cases are implemented in assembly. Let's say you want to jump if two values are equal. Well, jump equals has no additional operand parameter which values to compare. Instead, the actual implementation of that instruction is to jump if the zero flag is set. And before that jump equal instruction, you usually have a compare instruction. And here's what compare does. 
The comparison is performed by subtracting the second operand from the first operand and then setting the status flags in the same manner as the sub instruction. If you subtract the same value, the result is zero. If the values differ, the result is not zero. So if it's a zero, the zero flag is set in the E flex and then jump equal can check if the zero flag was set. As you can see, you might not directly set them yourself. It's like CPU housekeeping stuff where the CPU wants to remember something. In this case, the result of a compare or subtraction, but there are more flags and I want to focus on an E flag I didn't know existed and it's the IOPL flags. It's two bits, input, output, privilege level flags. The IOPL IO privilege level flag is a flag found on all IA32 compatible x86 CPUs it occupies bits 12 and 13 in the flags register. And it's used in order for the task or program to access IO ports. But it's important that IOPL can only be changed when the current privilege level is ring zero. So what are IO ports? Memory mapped IO, MMIO and port mapped IO, PMIO are two complementary methods of performing input and output IO between the CPU and peripheral devices in a computer. So IO ports are the secret how Intel CPUs access hardware. I'm familiar with memory mapped IO from microprocessors. Again, I'd like to reference my hardware wallet series where I explain memory mapped IO on an ARM processor. But ARM and Intel are different processor architectures, so they handle hardware differently. And this concept of ports was weird to me. Maybe it's the name and when I hear ports, I think of network ports, but that's of course something completely different. But this is where the Serenity exploit comes into play. As you now know, there was a vulnerability in the Serenity kernel ptrace handler for setting registers in another process. This exploit simply set the 12th and 13th bit and write the changed eflex with ptrace back to the other process. As you know, GDB uses ptrace to debug other processes, so we could try the same on Linux. As you can see, the zero flag is currently not set, but with set eflex and hex 40, we can set the seventh bit, which is the zero flag. And when we now check the registers, we can see the zero flag is set. We could just try to set all flags to zero. Let's do that. But when you check the registers, you see that apparently IF is still set. IF, interrupt enable flag, is also a privileged flag you are not supposed to change. A user program shouldn't just be able to disable all interrupts on the system. Now we could also try to set IOPL flags like the exploit did, hex 3000, but as you can see, it didn't do anything. Of course, we shouldn't be allowed to change those flags, but because Serenity OS didn't account for this and the kernel runs in ring zero, this code can set the E flags for us when we call ptrace set registers with the modified E flags. Okay, so now we have the IOPL flag set. Apparently, we are now allowed to talk to hardware via IO ports. And as Andreas said, this exploit implements a very basic IDE hard disk driver, which reads out a sector from the attached drive. And when you look into this code, specifically the inline assembly, you can find here port byte in and port byte out using the in and out assembly instructions. And this assembly instruction takes a port number. The in instruction reads a byte from a port and the out instruction writes a byte to that port. And before we continue with this code, I want to quickly jump back to my super simple Arduino blinking lights. Because when you write Arduino C code, you use functions like digital write to write to a pin. But under the hood in actual AVR assembly, there is an instruction to set a bit in a port. And there are also in and out instructions. These instructions write or read a byte to or from a port. Here is another blinking example using inline assembly with the out instruction, writing 0 or 1111 as a byte to the port number 5. And the port number references these entire 8 pins on the Arduino. 8 pins, 8 bit, 1 byte. Another port number corresponds to other 8 bits of pins. The AVR architecture of the Arduino and Intel architecture of modern CPUs are of course completely different, but they both have the concept of IO ports. 
And so the exploit here uses the out instruction to write to specific ports. And the port number we are using is based on this base hex 1f0. And when we look up a list of the strictly defined x86 Intel ports, we can see that the ports hex 1f0 to hex 1f7 are connected to the primary hard disk controller. You can imagine this as if a hard disk is connected to those Arduino pins. Isn't this incredible? When I saw this list, I also saw those ports at hex 6 0 dealing with PS2 controller. So keyboards and mice connected to that old school PS2 plug. And I found this awesome repository by Zero Santilli, x86 bare metal examples. And here in the PS2 keyboard assembly file, you can see it reads a byte from the port hex 6 0. So it reads whatever key you pressed on your connected PS2 keyboard. And this was a eureka moment for me. I realized that an x86 CPU is not much different from an Arduino microcontroller. Both need somehow instructions to write and read bits or bytes from wires connected to their chips. The difference is only that modern desktop CPUs have privilege level features so that only kernel code in ring zero can use instructions like in and out and the IOPL flags are not set for ring 3 processes so they can't directly talk to hardware. That's why they need to ask the kernel to read data from a hard disk using syscalls like read and write instead. And the kernel can then check permissions like file permissions to make sure you are allowed to read or not. Really, really cool. I think now I understand the link that I was missing.